In the past few months, I've been really quite interested in trying a minimalist phone. My current smartphone can do everything I need, but I do find it quite distracting sometimes. And so while in the past I've kind of followed the market and seen some of the options out there, they never really intrigued me until this year. I think there have been some really good developments in the space. This video is kind of serving as a way for me to learn about them and kind of see which one might be right for me. So hopefully some of the research I've done and the comparisons I show here will give you an idea of what the technologies are like, whether that's a color e-ink screen, a normal e-ink screen, or even a regular AMOLED or IPS screen. All of these companies have kind of the same ethos, but they have very different ways of doing so. I kind of equate it to like Android versus Apple. They all can do the same thing, but they do it differently and they appeal to different user bases. Like I love this S23 Ultra because it has a kind of pen here and that is a critical feature for me, but everyone's different. And there's some other ones I wanna talk about later as well that are not out yet, but could hit the market pretty soon and would be really cool if they did. So let's get into it. Now, based on the community tab poll that I put out, the first phone I wanna talk about is the Light Phone 3. And the Light Phone 2, if you're not aware, was a much kind of smaller device and it was based off of e-ink. The problem that the company mentioned is that e-ink is very slow. Like when I try to input text on this, it is incredibly frustrating and there's always a bit of a lag. So. They mentioned that about 50% of their users were not able to adapt to that. And that's a huge problem if you have people try this device that is supposed to be something kind of revolutionary for them in terms of minimalism and it ends up being more of a frustration. So it's certainly understandable why they went with a AMOLED screen that's a little bit bigger as well because it now does have a little bit more functionality to it. Now looking at the phone here, they've also added 5G and 4G LTE bands, which will allow it to be accessible in many more countries, which was one of the issues with the Light Phone 2 as well. And the form factor, they've created this kind of digital dial, similar to an Apple Watch or uh, this AirPod Max here I have, where this rotates and then it has a click. The Scroll wheel here will have the option of uh, controlling the brightness. I believe it will turn on flashlight as well. And it is a dedicated two-step shutter, which is cool for the photography. While the screen is monochrome, the actual shooting experience will maybe be something a little more similar to like a simple point and shoot, but I think it could be pretty fun. Not on the display. We don't want you holding it and tapping like a smartphone. So there's like a point and shoot camera color. So when you trigger, um, camera tool, the screen will bring up colors. The viewfinder, you know where you're seeing, and actually the size of the viewfinder is more like a point and shoot camera. And like as a photographer, I think it'll suffice for my basic needs when I'm out uh, just walking around or something. The best camera is the one you always have on you, and the Light Phone 2 did not have a camera. So I think that's a good feature they added. And I think it was really highly requested from users of the Light Phone 2. This is really a phone that I think is full featured, but minimalist. So you're really not gonna miss out on some of the important things where even if I wanna not be on it and not be distracted, there are certain kind of important features that you don't wanna miss out on. Like the convenience of when I go for a run and I forget my wallet and I wanna buy a drink after or something like that. These little things that you might not think about in day-to-day -day life, but actually really do have some impact, that is uh, something that the Light Phone looks like it's gonna be very good at. And like I'm showing here, the kind of planned obsolescence, this Super Note, for example, has the option to replace everything on it and will have an incredibly long, like five to maybe 10 year lifespan, maybe even further than that. And uh, this is my old Galaxy Note 3, but if I can even open this, oh yeah. I was always able to change the battery. And I mean, this is a prime example of why you'd want to change it. Uh, this, uh, maybe I'll get a close up, but this battery is clearly inflated and uh, has seen its life cycle for sure. It's a little, a little bloated, um, but yeah, this clearly doesn't last as long as it used to. Nor would you probably want to use it because it could be a fire hazard. This is maybe something I'll talk about later about 
kind of maybe turning it into a dumb phone. So they've worked to really improve the repairability and access to the battery, which is, is nice. And the screen is easier to replace and the USB port, which are some of the things that you probably know fail the most or break the most. And so the form factor of the light phone is really kind of embodiment of its utilitarian design, I think. There are two speakers as well, which should be good for like podcasts, speakerphone calls, whatnot, maybe, maybe FaceTime, I don't know if they'll add an app like that. And the display itself is a 3.92 inch AMOLED and it does have a matte cover on it. So one of the benefits of e-ink is that you get that outdoor visibility and it's just unparalleled in terms of the outdoor viewing experience. But the actual light phone here has a custom matte display and OLED has pretty good contrast. So I think we will actually get good performance outside with it. And so while some people might claim that the AMOLED is like a little bit of a compromise, the improved speed and improved kind of scrolling or typing experience, I think is really a good trade-off. Until e-ink gets better, we're starting to see e-ink screens like Carta 1300. And so I think in a year, maybe two years, those will be better to maybe where they can switch back to a e-ink screen or perhaps a transflective display. I'll get a little bit more into that later. And so Light OS is the Light Phone 3's operating system. I assume it's pretty similar to the Light OS 2, but they've implemented it for probably new resolution sizes and the new hardware. And so you can see the available tools currently are the alarm, calculator, calendar, directory, directions, hotspot, music, notes, voice memo, podcast, or timer, which is pretty much the essential tools that you would need. I can't, I was trying to think of like if there was something else in there that would be like necessary. And I think they kind of nailed it in terms of the minimalist and most utilized apps. But yeah, it seems like you guys were most interested in the light phone. I am certainly interested in this. I think the one downside of it is really the price. So when it was pre-ordered, it was $399. I think now it's actually, let's see the pre-order here. I think it's $499. Let's just uh, double check that. Yeah, pre-order, light phone. So it's at $499 and the base price is $799 which you're really starting to creep into like smartphone, very good smartphone territory at that price point. And so that's one of the biggest downsides I see of the light phone. Let me know your thoughts on the light phone down in the comments. Actually in the Verge article for the light phone three, I think there was uh, the top comment is actually something really interesting. I would recommend, I'll, I'll put a uh, kind of screenshot of it on the screen here, but uh, I would recommend taking a pause and reading it because while this may not be like the ideal device for you, you have to think there are people that are very susceptible to distractions with ADHD, ADD. Like this use case is valuable to some people. You might be like, why would I want a phone that's almost $800 and does way less than my phone? And that's surely a fair point, but I really equate it to like e-ink this device, the Remarkable 2, is something that I use daily. An iPad can do pretty much everything that the Remarkable 2 can do, but this gets me into flow state, and it's kind of like a, I kind of I like calling them unitasking or monotasking devices, where when I'm using it, there's no distractions, and I get into a flow state much, much easier than I would on a laptop, phone, or an iPad. So you have to realize that everyone's use case is very different. Now I'm in communication with the Light Phone team, so perhaps if they do end up getting review units, I would get one to try, but nothing is certain yet. Now on to the minimal phone. This is one I'm pretty excited about because uh, I do kind of have a specialty of e-ink devices, and this is an e-ink device and really kind of reminds me of the old Blackberries. Uh, anyone remember BBM, which was kind of the original iMessage back in the day? But it's a dual SIM device. I think from the initial release, they've actually increased the screen size. And so now it's a 4.3 inch uh, e-ink device. And it is 230 PPI, which is very similar to the Remarkable 2. I think it's 226 or 227. And so on a smaller device, that's a pretty good PPI, I'd say. Um, PPI is less important when you kind of shrink screens. Um, so it'll, it'll look good, but it is just black and white. 
and is very simplistic and it has a QWERTY keyboard. And I think the minimal phone has pretty cool hardware. Like my ideal use case for this is to be a phone that I can just replace during the workday so I don't get distracted. And so the QWERTY keyboard, like the Light Phone 2 I was talking about, how actually like kind of pressing down on keys on an e-ink device is very painful and not fun. I think on this it'll actually be good because my Remarkable has a type folio, for example, or I can connect the keyboard to this Supernote Nomad, but typing on e-ink is actually a pretty pleasant experience. And so I think the QWERTY uh, kind of design here will be better for and more apt for e-ink usage. You can see here, they're saying like the actual reality of most people's screen engagement per day. Let's imagine you're going from like 25 hours of screen time per week to then going to like five per week. That's a huge like difference and something you could be using on stuff that's way more productive or more important than just scrolling through social media. This does have a four by three aspect ratio. They even mentioned the full QWERTY keyboard is like Blackberry's approach. It's good for people that like physical screens over touch screens uh, for accuracy and speed. The back camera is 16 megapixels, which is pretty, pretty high resolution. And so this is just, this just seems like a really like productivity kind of powerhouse. And that's why I'm kind of excited about it. I've also reached out to this company. I haven't heard back from them yet, but there is an optional five megapixel camera on the front. Perhaps if you're in a business meeting and you need to do like a, a, a Zoom call or um, something else like that. And this is one of the only ones I've actually seen that has a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which is really cool. I love my IEMs and uh, kind of open back headphones I have over there. And so that's, that's a really, really cool option of um, having this with expandable storage. And it also has a dual SIM slot. So good for business people that might travel a lot and want an international SIM and a local SIM. And there is a mic on the bottom and a speaker on the bottom. For the OS, I believe it's running a custom Android 14 type skin. Dimensions, um, all these phones are, are relatively not that large. Uh, maybe the Wise phone is probably the biggest. The display does have a front light and a glare-free reading experience. It's not a backlight because it comes from the sides, kind of like the pocketbook color I have here. These are things that are actually illuminated from the side, and so there's a little extra layer in there. Because of the technology, you can't have the light coming from the back. It's coming from the sides and illuminating these reflective uh, pixels. And the minimal phone does have a very large battery. It's about 3,000 milliamp hours. So they haven't really given many claims, but I'm imagining that with an e-ink screen and this uh, kind of big battery, that it will have very good battery life. My guess would be it'll have the best of all of these that I'm talking about. But yeah, the minim minimal phone looks really exciting. Uh, comment down below if, if this is one of your favorites of the ones we've talked so far. I feel like the minimal phone kind of follows the form factor of this Panic Playdate I have here, which is actually a reflective screen. And um, it's kind of like e-ink, but we'll talk a bit more about this type of technology when I go into daylight. Yeah, just something really cool about having like physical tactile buttons on a device. And it's uh, kind of a little bit nostalgic, but very utilitarian too in the cold or when your hands are wet. <laughs> if you really want an e-ink device, I think this is probably the best option right now. And it's going for $399 pre-order right now. It will be $500, so significantly less than the Light Phone. If anyone from Minimal is watching this, then if you want to send me one to try for three months, I would be happy to do so and report my experiences on my day-to-day -day usage. Now, the third phone on the list from the survey is the Wise Phone 2. They had a Wise Phone 1, and so they've learned from some of the experience of that, kind of like the Light Phone. I actually just got off the phone for like a 30-minute kind of talk uh, with one of the gentlemen, Joshua who works at Techless, that is the parent company of the Wise Phone. So getting a little bit into this, their ethos is really to kind of minimize the distractions as well. And so they've built everything in a very simplistic manner. And this is one of the phones that looks more like a smartphone, 
but it does have simple fonts and colors and a focused design kind of, and it does have three cameras. So it does have like zoom, ultra wide, and a regular kind of lens, I would imagine. And so Wise OS is uh, kind of the OS they have, and they will have what they call a tool drawer, which as their users request things, so kind of like banking apps, um, things that can be used in a smart way, but aren't really distracting and aren't something that is very stimulating. Like you can see here, it's an intentionally boring phone. Even the maps is like more basic. It's just to get from point A to point B. Anyone uh, remember MapQuest back in the day? <laughs> so we'll just look at the quick features here. I verified that you can kind of do everything in the camera app like you can on a normal phone. And then the phone app, uh, messages, music. They do have expandable storage and that is, is kind of nice um, for, for having your own music on the device. And maybe they'll add music apps or like podcasting apps too, they mentioned. And I was asking Josh about these subscription plans they have. So instead of going to your carrier, you would pay directly through them. And I was asking if they're gonna open this up. He said that they might. I'll let him explain it here because it actually makes a lot of sense why they went this route. One of the things that we had with Wise Phone 1 is because it was our custom operating system, whenever, and that was unlocked, the phone was unlocked, but we had so much dealing with carriers and not because it wasn't compatible, it's just customers were having trouble because it was, they weren't used to seeing it. The operating system looks different. It's, you know, I don't know if you've seen shots of it or at least the home screen, right? Just the list of apps. So they would tell people it's not compatible when it actually is, like it works on their network and stuff, but they would just tell customers, no, it doesn't work. And so they wouldn't even try. And so then the customers were like, going back, like they said it don't work. And so we would be doing the carrier's job for them in a sense, trying to get them set up and chain, you know, getting all the networking thing. So that was one of the reasons of kind of going this route at the beginning. And so they're also very much into the kind of ideology of no data collecting and whatnot. And so people that are worried about that, this could be a good option for you as well. But they do have three plans and um, you can see the tiers here. I'll put them on the screen. And so each one offers a little bit more and it has more data as well, based on your minimalist needs. The Fairphone would be something also very interesting to kind of dumbify because that does have a path towards upgradability. And that could be really interesting because it's something that you change once, minimalize, and then you can keep that like for a very, very long time. So that's certainly interesting as well. And the Books Pama is something that seems a little long. It's more of an e-dedicated e-reader now. It doesn't have a SIM card and it's black and white. But if Books were to make a, if Books, if you're listening, if you were to make a color version with Kaleido 3 on that, with Books Super Refresh, so there's like no ghosting, and maybe, maybe if it had pen support, like a, a little siloed pen in that, I think that would be my ideal device to try and to have be a minimalist phone. This is the Books Palma. Fairly new e-reader. You wouldn't think because it looks like a smartphone. Yeah. You know, you can use it as a Kindle, but the cool thing about the Books Palma is that you can also do any other Android based thing. Yeah, it looks just like an Android phone. Try the camera. Oh my God. I don't know if this is gonna show up. Let's see if we can take a video of Mariah. That's very entry level Android phone. Right, it's obviously not gonna be fast. It's like a what? pretty decent, like the fact that that is polarizing a bunch of uh, ink and moving it around on the screen Quickly. that rapidly is crazy. Wow. Um, it did exactly what it was supposed to do, where I'd pull out my phone, get done the task that had entered my brain and put it back in my pocket. This thing is an actual joy to use. As someone who used it as their phone mm -hmm. for three days, I was like out with a bunch of people and I would take a picture of them with the phone and they would ask me like, please take pictures of me literally all night. My favorite part about this like dinky camera mm -hmm. is that it's SDR only. It will only do one exposure per click. So you do not get multiple exposure, high dynamic range. It doesn't look like a phone. It looks like a camera. They're like these super dope black and white pictures. You shouldn't use this as a phone 
unless you're like me and you are incredibly patient and, and have like literally three or four days to get it working. And but there are some uh, color versions of that that are coming out, like the Hisense phone. Uh, I'll leave Khalid Rakami is uh, another good guy in the e-ink space. I'll put some B-roll of those devices if you're interested in seeing those. But from his review, it didn't seem like they're really there yet. They have a few too many compromises, so I'm not very interested in those yet. And then finally, I did a live stream on the Daylight DC1, which if you're not familiar, is something kind of like the size of the Remarkable 2 here, but it uses uh, an Android skin and it has its it's going to have its own custom OS called Sol OS, but it uses what they call Live Paper, which is a proprietary technology they've developed. The CEO uh, has talked about it a bunch if you want to look that up. And uh, the li I'll link the live stream I did too. That is a transflective display, so it does have a backlight, but it's also very viewable in the daylight. But it does have 60 FPS, and they've even teased up to 120 FPS. So there is none of that like input lag, and when you're pinching zooming, it is very useful. I mentioned in that live stream I did that that device I really thought is more apt for a phone. So if they made like a daylight DC2, something like way smaller with the live paper technology and the Wacom digitizer, that would be super cool. And I would love to try something like that out if it came out. So some of these are hypotheticals, but I always like to talk about where this technology might go. I think it'd be incredibly cool if daylight made a DC2 type phone device, and the live paper is much more apt towards the phone application, I think, than it is on a tablet type device. That would be very interesting. So some of the things I do now to mitigate is limit app time on my Android device, and I also have a sleep mode, so after a certain hour at night, it will turn into black and white, and that They've done studies, but that significantly reduces your screen time, especially when you're like scrolling through social media or watching YouTube or video or something. It's hard to describe, but you just like lose all interest in it because it's black and white. And so that's worked to mitigate some stuff. And uh, also in the morning, the sleep mode continues. So first thing in the morning, I'm not using it uh, and scrolling social media or getting on YouTube which I'm sure you're watching YouTube right now, you know, can be a distraction. I think one of the things I might try first is really kind of turning my device or maybe an old device that I have into a dumb phone and having that be like a second number or perhaps just use that during the work week. My goal here really is I want to try one of these phones for three months. And so my ideal scenario would be using it during the workday so I don't get distracted, but it has all the features that I need. And then after work and weekends, use my regular phone and kind of document that experience over three months and see where that kind of takes me and how I like it and some of the nuances that I might find in that process. But I might try to convert my phone or an old phone that I have into a dumb phone and see how that experience goes first. But in terms of the phones I've discussed here, I think they're all very intriguing and interesting. But yeah, let me know down in the comments uh, which of these devices, or maybe there's one I missed that uh, you find very interesting and would like to try. If you're interested in the phone I currently use, I'll leave a review of that up here. Uh, I did a kind of long-term one-year review of it, but thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.